Good morning and welcome to the final idea forum in a series next movement co hosted by the Presser Foundation and American composers forum Philadelphia chapter. My name is Teresa Rogers and I serve as executive director of the Presser Foundation. Special thanks to Dustin Hurd, who has provided all the marketing and technical technical support to produce the series. This is a webinar version of Zoom, and that just means that participants are not seen, but do have the ability to um, ask questions in the Q&A window. Dustin and I will be monitoring the questions, and we will do our best to ask those on behalf of participants. All five idea forums have been recorded and, are, and have been made available for future viewing. We'll be in communications with links to access all the recordings. Each presentation will be 25 to 30 minutes long today with five minutes for questions and answers. And we hope to wrap up within an hour and a half, um, which brings us to about uh, 1130 AM. The impetus for next movement came from so many conversations that I've had over the past five months. Um, since COVID hit with executive directors and artistic directors um, and development directors um, who shared with me their struggles, their triumphs. And it was really clear um, from the onset that people were craving interaction with their colleagues in the field. They wanted to uncover best practices. They wanted suggestions for technology, ideas for creative program delivery and um, now what's most important, it seems, is thoughts on the future. I must say, when I took this uh, concern to the trustees of the Presser Foundation, there was immediate interest to support our grantee organizations beyond typical grants, and thus uh, Next Movement was formed. So 26 organizations answered the call for proposal to present targeting music educators, music presenters, music performers, Performers, and we selected 10 organizations to present at five idea forums. Um, two of those for music educators, two for music performers, and one for music presenters. So today's session, it is the last in the series, and it's also the second of two forums focused on music performers. We are so grateful today to have um, Tempesta de Mare and the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, we are grateful for their openness to share their creativity and working alongside us to develop today's presentations. Um, so without further delay, I'm so um, happy to provide a special welcome to Ulrika Shapiro and Gwen Roberts from Tempesta de Mare. Tempesta de Mare are on a quest to deliver content with artistic merit with early music performers becoming producers talk show hosts, video editors, online tech evaluators. They figured out how to host a watch party on Vimeo and launched a new online series called Tempesta Talks. They may not have all the answers, but they are figuring it out. So um, welcome, Ulrika and Gwen. Well, thank you, Teresa, for this introduction and also for everything that the Pressa Foundation has done um, to support the arts and music in Philadelphia and Tempesta di Mara in particular over the many years. So we couldn't be more pleased to be part of this amazing initiative. So I'll uh, get you started with just a little bit more background on Tempesta. Um, uh, so we are the Philadelphia Baroque Orchestra and have just completed our 18th season of concerts. Um, our focus has always been from the beginning on uniquely crafted orchestral and chamber programs with fresh interpretations of established masterworks alongside rediscoveries. And this has led Tempesta to um, have produced and performed over 35 modern world premieres and many more US and regional premieres of music that was written 250, 300 years ago. We, cross, uh, we tour across the US and also internationally. And we have recorded 12 CDs on the British label Chandos, um, which are together with our growing library of concert recordings broadcast on radio stations across the world in over 56 countries. 
we manage all this from our offices in South Philadelphia and more recently from our home offices across town um, with a team, um, well-established team of three leaders. And those are our artistic founders and co-directors, Gwyn, Rot Gwyn Roberts and Richard Stone. And Gwyn is joining me today. Um, and myself as a managing director. And we also have a one to two part-time staff members that work with me. Um, on production and um, logistics. Um, Pre-COVID, our annual budget was between five and six thousand dollars, six hundred thousand dollars. Woof, that would be something to do it on five to six thousand um, dollars. Anyway, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. On the day of the shutdown and the travel ban, so March 13th, if I recall, um, I had just arrived in Germany. Um, our orchestra of 29 musicians was waiting at various airports, bags packed pretty much, because we were embarking on a four concert Germany tour. That would have seen our debut in Dresden, a concert on Bach's birthday at the Thomaskirche in Leipzig, and the closing concert of the International Telemann Festival in Magdeburg. We ha had 18 fans to come along with us um, for a specially curated tour of archives, museums, and the cities. And I think we all felt very strongly that we were poised for a great success. So what happened then was a mess and also a devastating loss. Um, after just a few days though, it also was immediately clear that what we needed to do to move forward was to continue with our mission of artistic excellence to support our artists and to continue offering exceptional musical experiences to our audiences. So we scrambled and we went ahead and announced a 2021 season in early May. At that time, we didn't have any dates outside of vague concert weekends. We did not have any venues of any programs that we were planning and we had never done a streamed or virtual performance before. So we announced it anyway, and we announced that we were gonna hold concert weekends that would be offered virtually and possibly in person. Um, and Gwyn will take it from here to talk a little bit about the technical and artistic challenges we've tackled since. Okay, well, yes, good morning. I'm Gwyn Roberts. I'm one of the two founding um, artistic directors of Tempesta di Mare and uh, I guess I'm now a video producer as well, or something like that. Um, as Ulrika said, we, um, we were poised for this concert tour. And in fact, right before the shutdown, we had just put on a full orchestra concert weekend um, with the material that we were going to be taking to Germany, or half of it actually. And so we had great video that we could share with people that hadn't gone out into the world yet. But somehow, just streaming the concert as it was seemed not quite right to the moment. It's always just a little bit less than, and um, you have a concert on a screen in a box with possibly tinny video um, and looking at an audience and wanting to be there. And it's not quite, quite. So we thought initially about what we needed to do. One thing we wanted to do was, um, attract um, subscribers to our next season with um, evidence that what we could deliver would be high quality audio and video. So that was job one. Job two was to use our archived material and in fact new material to deliver content that was on brand in that it um, tells stories and looks at music from new points of view, um, but also um, adds content that we couldn't do in person. So that became our Tempesta Talk series. Um, our first project was a watch party. And this was our concept of um, showing what we were gonna be able to deliver in the next season um, and giving proof of concept of quality and we hoped sell subscriptions. So for that, I worked with our video and audio engineers to uh, produce a uh, multi-camera, um, high quality version of the concert. Believe me, it was actually, it was painful to do that because of all that we had had to walk away from. 
but we came up with a good version of the concerts. Um, and we made a script for um, Ulrika and Richard and me and our concert master, Emlyn Nye and cellist Lisa Terry um, that we had anticipated presenting kind of the way we're doing this today as maybe a Zoom webinar. And then we had a rehearsal on a Wednesday before our Saturday showtime. And boy, were we unhappy with the um, audio and visual quality. It was not um, what we had hoped to be able to deliver. And it's certainly not something that I would have paid for. I think we're all kind of familiar with how Zoom sounds now. And that was not what we wanted. So um, that led us to a scramble to search for a better platform. Um, and we landed on Vimeo live stream. Vimeo is of course the sort of YouTube analog um, that is of higher quality um, of content um, and or higher quality of, of tech delivery. And um, Vimeo itself had bought a company called Livestream, which does exactly what it sounds like it does. Um, and so we set about learning how to do that, which is complicated. Um, among other things, Richard and I are musicians and we couldn't even come up with often what is the word we want to look for in the index that will result in the answer to the question we have about how to do it? The, um, the material is very much geared at people with a tech background that we don't have. But um, we managed to get it to happen. Let me just show you something here. I want to show you what the, um, what the screen looks like when you're um, doing one of these. Here's my screen share. And if you take a look at this, this looks a lot like a, um, a sound editing board, right? So you've got your preview of what's coming up next in the upper left corner. You've got your thing that's on right now in the middle at the top. You've got all these sliders. You've got a lineup of all the different cameras and feeds. And yeah, so we were managing that while we were um, actually hosting the show. And then we had another rehearsal. And that was on Friday, the day before the show. And it became clear that even though we had planned on flying in all these guests, um, that our little laptop, which was the most up-to-date computer in our house, um, wasn't up to it beyond one guest. If you put more than one guest feed in, the laptop's fan went absolutely berserk and there was nothing we could do. Um, so we had to cut it down to just Ulrika as a guest host. And our um, concert master and principal cellist pre-recorded their videos um, with their content. And we went with that. Um, as we got down to the last moment though, we had one final snafu, which was that in attempting to verify the speed at which we were broadcasting, um, Richard inadvertently stopped the stream a half an hour before the broadcast. And when he restarted it, it had a new, I it had a new link that we had to share with all the people who had signed up, which I know affected the actual concert viewership. Um, but you learn as you go. So um, during the broadcast, everything worked pretty much. Um, and I'll show you a little uh, excerpt of what we did. Um, this is a part in the uh, broadcast where um, we had just been talking beforehand about what it's like to be an unconducted orchestra and um, how, we, how we talk to each other, how we communicate while playing, um, how we arrive at a unified um, interpretation. And then we were showing some video. I'm only going to show you a little bit because, again, quality on Zoom. And then Richard and I took a, a question from the chat. You'll notice that we're both looking up and to our left while we're on camera. That's another thing we learned, that we had the laptop over here and we had the other screen over here and we're figuring it out. Here we go. Here's my uh, little excerpt of that program.
you just watched Tempesta di Mare performing a concerto in G by Johann Friedrich Fasch. And let's take a question from Jeffrey Selling from the chat. Jeffrey asks, how many in-person rehearsals does to come from many places? Well, um, not the whole group is there for all the rehearsals is really the answer. Mm -hmm. um, we get together, the, the two of us, um, to talk about the music and mark things into the score for expression before anybody shows up. And then Emlyn chimes in with Boeings. And then um, Emlyn and Lisa and Richard and I get together for what we call Director's Day. And we play through everything and make sure all the ideas that we have are matching and work. And we add stuff. And that's two rehearsals. And then we have a two rehearsal day with all the principals where we add our principal second violin, Becky Harris, and our principal viola, Daniela Pearson, and our harpsichordist, Adam Pearl. And um, if we have any named soloists or if there's like hard, hard oboe licks, we'll bring in Priscilla. Um, so then we have one day of two rehearsals with the principals. And what we're doing here is we're expanding the circle. And at each stage, the next set of musicians adds to the interpretation. Yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, the idea is that we have this uh, process of, of enhancement. Mm -hmm. So um, we, build, we build on the idea that starts at the core. Mm -hmm. And it's concentric circles. So by the time the whole band arrives, there have already been two days of rehearsals and we've got some stuff locked in. And the whole orchestra is there then for three days. Two there's sessions always a day. good ideas coming from them too. Yeah, exactly. So so that's what we do. And we were trying to um, create um, a, a possibility for people to come essentially back into the process with us. Um, Ulrika has just posted a link in the chat if you wanted to see what the program actually looked at at high resolution, um, which was in fact really quite good quality. We were pleased with it. I'll pass this over to Ulrika again. Yeah, so um, in, in, despite that snafu at the end, which um, was quite a scramble for my staff and I to reach all the 100, over 160 household registrant, registrants that had signed up for this watch party, um, we did have uh, over 267 unique live views at the time of the broadcast. Um, of the registrants, we later an analyzed that, those numbers and about 26% were new to Tempesta. Um, and about 30% made also a small donation with their registration. In a post-event um, questionnaire, we asked if they if people would pay for similar content and 80% said they would pay $10 or more and 45% said they would pay more than $15. Um, people viewed from the US and Canada, multiple European countries, Colombia and South Korea. So overall, it was a fun event and a great success and really was a wonderful connector with our audience. Um, we then embarked on the next, next level of what we needed to learn, which is to find a way to deliver the content and integrate it with our marketing efforts, database, ticket sales, et cetera, because we are um, planning to make this uh, an earned revenue stream for Tempesta to survive. Um, so we have um, patron manager as our CRM, and at the time, they also were trying to help their clients and they started a beta trial team for a streaming and virtual event portal that they were developing and launching. And um, so we joined that team um, and we are part of it um, now still through September. Um, we can try out new ideas and ask them to consider suggestions we have. And um, to be eligible, we had to upgrade all our event listings and switch over to a new layout platform, which we had been put off for months. And um, we, we scrambled to get that all ready um, and also started a major website redesign um, to help us improve our upload speeds and streamline, streamline functionalities on our website to make embedding of video content more user friendly. Um, that is an ongoing process and I have a very quick um, screen to share with you about that, uh, which shows that that work has already improved our speeds dramatically. So our current website 
has on our mobile about a 22 rating and our website has a 57 speed rating and our new site that we have in development clearly beats that by an exciting ratio. So we're looking forward to that um, results as we move forward with this quest. So as we are trying out all these parts, we were ready um, to um, trial them out with our Tempesta talk series, which Gwyn also is gonna tell you a little bit more about. All right, so the Tempesta talk series um, is something that we intend to do throughout the year. Um, it's using our archived content in as many different creative ways as we can think of um, to bring people inside music. We want to tell stories around and behind it. We want to draw attention to aspects of performance that might otherwise escape notice. Um, we want to bring the aud audience into the process of how we make the music. We want to provide tools also for active listening so that um, people listen in a different way while they're watching the video. And we hope also um, moving forward when we can actually play music for them again live. The first one that we did was about um, Telemann's famous Don Quixote suite. And um, having learned from the sort of the process of multitasking that we were doing um, during the watch party, Richard and I decided to um, pre-record a segment about each of the movements from the suite, um, which let us also include um, graphics and video and other kinds of examples and enhancements, some of which I'm about to show you. Um, and then we came again live on camera in between the segments as we had done at the watch party and engaged with our audience and took questions. So um, this was much calmer um, as far as the experience of putting the show on the air because we could just load our videos rather than having to deal with all the content live ourselves. Um, and here is an example of that um, in which we actually um, used some video that was not of playing music. Don Quixote's and Sancho's rides were Don Quixote's horse, Rocinante, and Sancho's donkey. Rocinante, whom Don Quixote imagined to be this great charger, was actually a workhorse ready for retirement. Mm -hmm. And the musical form that Telemann gives these characterizations is the dance form known as the passe-pied, which is the minuet's fast cousin. Here is a passe by Jean-Marie Leclerc, just a little bit of one, so that you know what a normal passe is supposed to sound like. Telemann has a lot of fun here upending expectations. He bends the music to the character of the animals rather than the social dance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so from our perspective as interpreters, what's titled the gallop of Rocinante, gallop, can be a gallop in Don Quixote's mind, worthy of his fleet charger steed. But to the outside observer, Rocinante is this retired barn horse who at best goes at a saunter. Mm -hmm. So um, Rocinante gets an uncharacteristically pokey version of a passepied mm -hmm. to represent him. Yeah. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. So here we're going to talk about um, the donkey. But the high and low voices of the orchestra in turn refuse to play the third beat of measure, as though the donkey is refusing to move on those beats. That's right. And that was fun to imitate in our performance. What we did is we would take those two steps, the two beats that the donkey actually will take, bum bum, and we would accent each one of them so that the third beat, which was silent, because nobody steps there, is in essence a loud, a loud silence. So it was like bump, bump, yeah. bump, bump, and digging in our heels. Yeah. We also doubled the tune of the first violins with the solo bassoon. 
because bassoons are funny. Bassoons are funny. Bassoons are funny. So that was our Tempesta Talks um, debut. And um, I think Ulrika wants to talk about results and feedback. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> yeah, so we had, oops, sorry, fire engine going by my street. Um, for this one, we uh, sold tickets and um, we had a very truncated marketing time, just about a week. Um, and we did sell 46 tickets. Um, we sell them at $20 a piece and we had over 80 unique live views at the event. Um, we did another post uh, concert questionnaire or post event questionnaire and we asked um, how they liked the way we delivered the content versus um, a content that would be more like a you know, like a camera view of a performance. And two thirds, over 72 percent um, of people who responded preferred virtual content that was more produced with enhanced content such as the live chat support support a supplemental or pre-recorded information like we did for the Don Quixote etc um, and uh, the same percentage about 67 percent would prefer content available on demand on a finite period of time to watch at their convenience as opposed to in real time as a live stream only. So we are taking all these things into consideration as we're designing our programs um, starting in September with our eight scheduled season performance programs. Um, so a little bit earlier, I talked about that we launched a subscription series to our concerts um, without knowing anything. And I'm very pleased and was somewhat surprised to report that our subscription sales have been very strong. In fact, um, they've been surpassing what we've achieved in previous years, especially when we look at that um, purchases of the whole eight concert series has doubled from the year before. So um, 26 of our first time subscribers so far, um, oh, so 26% are first time subscribers so far and 12% of those reside in outside of the tri-state area, which is also um, giving us a first glimpse of how we can promote our series now, not just in Philadelphia and the region, but beyond our borders here, and especially even maybe in the whole world. Um, we are planning to sell individual virtual tickets um, at this time for all our concerts, and we are planning to move forward with selling them at the same price as we charge for in-person pre-pandemic tickets. Um, and we are planning to bundle experiences and mini series so people can um, access them also, uh, have access to our on-demand library of content for finite time and, and putting together different kind of packaging that might appeal to a broader um, constituency. So what we have coming forward in terms of ideas, in addition to an actual concert series where we will be performing maybe only for camera sometimes, maybe sometimes with a live audience as things move forward and delivering that content as our subscription concert series, we will also have more of these Tempesta talks. Um, the next one is this coming Sunday in which our concert master and principal cellist talk about the Baroque bow and everything that it does expressively that makes our music sound the way it does. Um, other things we'll have are a program with one of our violinists who has commissioned um, 18th century style men's fashion for himself and done a lot of research into what the coat that you were wearing as a 18th century violinist did for your technique, which is really interesting. Um, uh, we have our, one of our cellists talking about the process of learning a Bach cello suite. We'll have our harpsichordist and, and lutenist talking about um, basso continuo and what it is and how it's improvised and what you can do. It's powerful with it. Um, I'm going to give, in conjunction with our program, our concert of the Four Winds, I'll give a tour of my ridiculously overstuffed cabinet of recorders and historical flutes and what they all do. 
So we've got some stuff coming up. I think that's all we had to say. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I'm gonna hop in here. And uh, first off, thank you for the presentation. Um, and I'm gonna share a couple questions that we had. Um, can you talk about uh, a little bit if, if you encountered, and maybe this, since the, the repertoire you work with is a bit older, this is less of an issue, but any issues you might have encountered thus far with say copyright or permissions um, and that sort of thing, or working with the musicians uh, and putting content online specifically? So I'll talk about the, uh, the copyright stuff and maybe Ulrika, you can talk about the contracting and how we're dealing with our musicians on it. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. We are dealing entirely with music that is, you know, 250, 300 years old. Um, and we, we manage the copyright situation um, by creating all of our own editions in-house based on the um, 18th century originals. So we're not infringing on anybody's edition copyrights. We play from paper rather than tablets, um, which gets around whatever the issue is with um, tablet ownership. And um, we still, of course, get, um, get flagged on YouTube all the time for people who claim to have the rights to the music that we have created this way ourselves. My favorite was that um, the applause on one of our videos, um, not the music, the applause at the end of some Falconieri was claimed as the copyright of um, a, a John Elliott Gardner recording of Bach the applause. So, I mean, we, we dispute these all the time um, and we're part of a, uh, uh, an effort with uh, Early Music America, which is joining with things like Chorus America and um, American League of Orchestras to lobby for um, the, the bots that um, are flagging all of our content, not just us, but everybody's um, to get that situation addressed. Um, so that's how that happens, Ulrika. Yeah, I mean, our artists have just been amazing partners for us. Um, they always are so inspirational and so willing to go the extra mile together with us. Um, so we are actually delivering our programming in like section. Like, so we have announced the season, but we are um, got their buy-in to let us contract them only on shorter bursts this season so we are can give them a more detailed um kind of uh, way of hiring them for this year and that is um i, I don't know if that's as answering the question but you know they they you know they're open to broadcasting um because they also realize that by doing these sort of things we have a way of earning revenues and making this whole puzzle work Yes, we have, um, we did uh, pay our artists for um, the programming that we were not able to produce. Um, and we also, um, it's part of our contract with them that we're allowed to use our recorded performances in non-commercial or um, beneficial to Tempesta ways. So that's all been um, dealt with contractually ahead of time. Great. Um, maybe along those lines, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, it looks like you're working with a lot of sort of uh, recordings and documentations of previous concerts, concerts that happened post or pre-COVID. Um, one, can you talk a little bit about how you've approached pre-COVID uh, documenting concerts and then maybe uh, sort of more, uh, I guess, a reflection of how you imagine this coming year you'll, you'll approach recording concerts, if at all. Um, so yes, we, we've been so far using uh, material that was recorded in the before times. Um, we, we will, as Ulrika mentioned, um, be putting on new programming this season, starting with a lute recital in September, which is the smallest possible thing, um, and then a chamber concert in October. Um, another couple of chamber concerts, our next scheduled orchestral concert attempt is in March. So. Um, we hope by then we'll be able to actually do it. Um, we have um, assembled not only our existing audio visual team, um, which has been working with us now for the recordings like the ones I just showed you, um, 
but also a dedicated producer who's going to run the Vimeo for us um, for this um, coming for the live concerts. And when we can't have an, have an audience, we're going to pre-record the concert on a separate day um, with all those people in place and the musicians. Um, the upcoming one with the first one with the chamber musicians will be in a tent so that we have um, outside air circulation possibilities, all of those sorts of things that we need to be cognizant of for um, COVID precautions. Um, and then we'll have a day to do production and then the stream becomes available on the weekend. So that, that's how we're planning on doing that. And as Ulrika said, um, consistent with what our audience has um, expressed in the questionnaires, we'll be able to add additional content, make it look more produced and um, deliver it for on-demand viewing to our subscribers over a period of time. Fantastic. Uh, just a final question, and I'm, I think uh, you you both sort of have alluded to this, but I'm curious, you know, especially since you had a, a tour that was was canceled, um, but you've also seen that there's a, a, a bit of an audience for your work outside of the Philadelphia region with these streaming programs. Um, how have you been thinking about, you know, maybe in the future, like what the potentials for uh, really reaching people internationally, but also how maybe some of this stuff might continue when we can go back to sort of traditional concerts. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much potential. Um, I think it's always been a little bit our strong suit because of the kind of repertoire that Tempesta performs, which I've alluded to in the beginning that we have repertoire that is new in our field. So the premieres um, have given us an edge maybe over many even European Baroque ensembles by um, being out there showing repertoire that is not accessible anywhere else. And so there is already a kind of a, a, a calling card, let's say, in the international Baroque music community about Tempesta um, performing that kind of repertoire. And therefore we we already have some, um, some name recognition um, in the whole world for those sort of out of the box, you know, like, a, a, you know, off the beaten path kind of repertoire. And I, I mean, with everything, I think our biggest challenge in these times, the opportunities are great. The ways to reach out are endless. I wish I had 10 times more hours and, you know, more funds or more, I mean, just really more time. Um, and as I said before, for a small organization like ours, you know, it's, it's a daily struggle just to figure out what is the next thing that we need to do. So yes, help me, somebody. <laughs> I would like to add to that, that um, yes, we are going back to Germany. So the tour has been rescheduled for um, two years out from where it was. So I'm delighted that that, assuming everything goes as it should, will happen after all. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to expand our subscribers considerably beyond the local area. And also to expand to people who simply can't travel, can't go out. So um, I think there's a fair amount of that also in, um, in potential new reach, thanks to this situation. Thank you so much to both of you. Fantastic presentation. And thanks for sharing your, your creativity and your uh, dedication to your art form. I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa now, who will uh, introduce uh, our next guest from the Philadelphia Orchestra. Teresa, yeah, take it away. Just, just to echo Dustin, thank you very much, Gwen and Ulrika. Um, I, and I did want to highlight that uh, participants can see in the chat the links that Ulrika um, has provided to the watch party, to Tempesta Talks, and their season programming. Um, and now I'm honored to introduce Matthias Tarnopolsky, President and CEO of the Philadelphia Orchestra. The Philadelphia Orchestra um, is going to share their key organizational shifts shifts and strategies in response to COVID. 
from live stream concerts and new performance videos to here together and online education, the Philadelphia Orchestra continues to innovate and reimagine the season and beyond. And now, Matthias. Thank you so much, Teresa. And um, thank you so much to the Presser Foundation. You were among the very first of our colleagues to get on the phone uh, with us in, in March. And we're just incredibly, incredibly grateful to you for helping us navigate this incredible, incredible time. Um, wonderful to be on a panel with Tempesta de Mare. It's so fantastic to hear you play. I mean, really, it just comes across in the video. And I just really want to congratulate my colleagues at Tempesta for a really inspirational, for keeping the music alive in such an inspirational way. Uh, so I'm here to share some of the Philadelphia Orchestra's journey uh, between March 12th, Thursday, March 12th, uh, a day indelibly, um, in, in del indelibly etched in our memories, uh, and today, um, March 12th was the last day that the Philadelphia Orchestra all played together. So I'm going to, I prepared a bit of a presentation. Um, so much of my life has been about presentations uh, with uh, audiences, boards, staff, colleagues, musicians of the orchestra, everyone. Um, so I'll share the narrative in the form of a presentation. Happy to, of course, answer any, any questions throughout. So the first thing that we realized when, when this whole thing started was that we couldn't just be boats tossed on um, a tempest. Uh, and we really thought that we needed to imagine a future and try and define it among all the uncertainty. And so we said to ourselves, we must define the future and not simply hope that things will be okay. Um, and it was very clear that our society was being reshaped by this incredible crisis. And so we asked ourselves, and we ask ourselves daily, what, was, what must we do now um, to make sure that we fulfill our roles and responsibilities in shaping a good, empathic, kind Philadelphia, our immediate community on the other side of this crisis? I mean, we really felt that um, we needed to be there for our audiences, for our education and um, community partners, and we needed to do what we could do. Uh, if we couldn't do it in person, then digitally to stay, to stay connected. But then on the other side of this, and we didn't know in March when that would be, we were planning scenarios where we'd be back in May, um, and that clearly wasn't, isn't the case. Um, but we needed to take steps to make sure that everyone was, was okay on the other side of this. And we still ask ourselves that very question every day. Uh, we also very quickly um, realized that March 12th, this concert was going to be the last time we uh, played together for a long time. I want to tell a bit of a story about this particular day. So here's a, um, a photograph of the Kimmel Center. The concert on March 12th, which was a concert of two Beethoven symphonies, Beethoven's Fifth and Sixth Symphonies, and a new work by um, a young composer called Iman Habibi called Every Tree Speaks, Jeder Baum Spricht in German. It was going to be a world, it was a world premiere. Um, we decided that day that <clears throat> We started the morning thinking that the concert was going to go ahead probably as normal. Then during the course of that morning's rehearsal, um, we heard that public assembly was uh, being limited to 250 people. So we had to write to our audiences, email our audiences, call them, let them know that there would be no public in the auditorium that night. But I quickly called um, WHYY, Bill Marazzo, my colleague at WHYY, and said, can you film today's concert? And they said, they said, yes, absolutely, we could talk to the musicians of the orchestra who were delighted to be able to film the concert and stream it live. And let me say, that decision, which started off with us talking about maybe we'll just do it live on the radio and turned into we have to capture this and put it out live on our website and on the internet. 
on our website and on Facebook. Um, usually those conversations take months and months. We decided within half an hour that this was an absolute necessity. It turned out to be such a moving and powerful event. To hear the orchestra play in front of an empty hall was astonishing. And the video captures that. And especially at the end when they all the musicians of the orchestra and our incredible music director, Yannick Nezesegan, stand and acknowledge the empty house. Um, it's one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in a concert hall and unforgettable. And we didn't realize then that that was the last time we were all going to gather together. That, that concert has been viewed, um, we say a million times there, uh, it's now far, far more than that. It's an incredible document in the orchestra's history and also in, in our society's history. It was also the day, of course, that we stopped selling tickets. And so we had to really galvanize the organization around a set of priorities, because if we stop selling tickets, our two major revenue sources are philanthropy and ticket sales. So we very quickly articulated this set of priorities. We need to take care of our people. We need to maintain the integrity of the ensemble and of the business. Um, harness Yannick's talents virtually. We have a sensational music director whom we're in touch with almost daily. Uh, he is at his home in Montreal, but has been deeply connected virtually, including making music virtually with the musicians of the orchestra since March. Mm -hmm. We launched the virtual Philadelphia Orchestra, which has since evolved. Um, as a means to stay connected to our audiences and communities, not just in Philadelphia, but nationally and as Tempesta showed earlier on, internationally too. We launched our really dynamic 2021 season, which we sort of put out there as a beacon to the future, um, incredibly warmly received. It has a theme, it's called Our World Now, and it was about, the 2021 season is about how music can help us connect in different ways and think anew about the world around us. Um, continue to inspire philanthropy, so inspire loyal patrons in Philadelphia and beyond to support the orchestra. And given that we felt right away that this was going to be a disruption to our business that was going to last um, but well, we didn't feel this right away, actually. I remember we first thought that this was going to be sort of maybe we'll be back in May as a best case scenario. But soon as the weeks progressed, we realized that the disruption to our business was going to be um, longer term. And so to build a financial reserve for the orchestra um, for the fiscal three or four fiscal years to come. And we're still working on that. And above all, this idea that we have a plan, we're in this together. And when we started saying that in March, um, literally on March 13th, Friday, March 13th, um, it didn't feel as slogan-like as it does today. Um, the intensity of the communication within the organization, the power of the work together with musicians and staff and board and community, has that, that sense of unanimity has been an incredible force for us, uh, both a motivator and inspirer, and it's um, allied with these priorities has really been helping us navigate the last few months. So the first thing we thought about was in order to sustain the artistic excellence of the orchestra, the civic commitments, um, our presence with our public is uh, we need to think about our finances and none of what we have achieved in the last few months would have been possible without the financial support of many donors, including the Preza Foundation, which is why we're incredibly touched to be on this panel today and thankful um, to Teresa and the team. Um, Preza in particular quickly realized the essential need for the orchestra to continue its work and the need to support that. So we're, um, as I said, incredibly grateful. Philanthropic partners throughout the community have responded with great creativity and flexibility as well, such as lifting restrictions from funds that were tailored to specific projects. They said, you know, you've got to rethink who you are and what you do. Um, 
you know, we're lifting the restrictions uh, pro and providing new support. And within the organization, we've not only tightened our expenses in every way possible, we've also been developing new lines of business through these digital channels. Um, we had to reduce um, expenses, obviously, and we've done that in many ways. One of the key ways is um, everyone in the organization uh, took a pay cut, the musicians of the orchestra, uh, took a voluntary salary reduction of 20% uh, and there were staff salary reductions throughout the organization, many of them voluntary as well, that went from 60% to 0% uh, for people earning below a certain threshold. Uh, we received funding from the payroll protection program and the CARES, the CARES Act, which was invaluable in helping sustain uh, the orchestra to make sure that we didn't face a cliff, but rather a slope. Um, many patrons donated their tickets for cancelled concerts, um, so people who were holding tickets between March and June, uh, many donated them. We had about a 50% donation rate, which was, from what we've learned since, has been um, far in excess of what many uh, colleague orchestras around the country uh, realized through ticket donations. It just shows the commitment of Philadelphia patrons to the orchestra and the love of music that exists in our community. The other thing, of course, we learned very quickly is as uncertainty is, is the norm. You know, we plan many years in advance and suddenly we didn't know, and even today we still don't know, what could be happening next week or the week after. What this all led us to um, was a pivot to becoming a media organization, one that needed to make programs, that needed to be in front of its audiences through digital channels. So we launched the Virtual Philadelphia Orchestra to maintain and enrich that vital connection to our community and offered new ways to engage them with the music and musicians of, of the orchestra. And the Virtual Philadelphia Orchestra has three strands to it, watch, listen, and learn. So uh, watching, uh, watch the videos of, uh, of, of, the, of orchestra performances, both current and historic, um, listen uh, through the, streaming audio uh, on the internet and learn the delivery of our education and community programs via virtual Philadelphia Orchestra. So um, we also, I mean, the um, flowering of creativity from within the orchestra has also been incredible. We created these wonderful videos that we've distributed through social media. This one shows a collaboration with the multimedia art, arts organization, 59 Productions, um, out, of, out of London, which is a love letter to Philadelphia, which is a drone footage of Philadelphia, um, superimposing musicians of the orchestra and Yannick onto iconic buildings throughout our city. And they played specially Rachmaninoff's vocalese. Um, and it really is a beautiful love letter for Philadelphia. I'll put the link up for, for you to see it. Um, we also decided that we can't stand still. So we started commissioning new work. And this was the first major new work that we commissioned. It's a real, um, it, it's become the anthem of the Philadelphia Orchestra. It's called Seven O'Clock Shout. It's by the composer Valerie Coleman. Um, and it's called Seven O'Clock Shout because it's a dedication to frontline workers. And what you see here is the video that we uh, created, musicians recording their parts at home. Um, and it was uh, produced and assembled by uh, our um, sound engineer, Andrew Mellor, and the video producer, Rich Tolsma. Um, and it's a beautiful piece of music. And hopefully when we reconvene uh, in September in, a, in smaller ensembles, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, we'll be playing this as one of the first pieces that, that we perform. Valerie Coleman, Seven O'Clock Shout. It's a, 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 you can see it on our Facebook page and website. Valerie's a brilliant composer and she wrote the perfect piece for the COVID moment. And you know, our commitment to move forward by ensuring the creation of new work, even uh, in this crazy COVID time. 
Virtual Philadelphia Orchestra Learn is our education platform that's already, as you can see, reaching thousands of young musicians. Um, you know, we have incredible relationships from uh, around around the world. You know, the orchestra, as you all I'm sure know, has been traveling, say, to China since 1973. And we've maintained those connections even uh, at uh, at this time. So we have all kinds of um, educational resources that we're um, providing free of charge through Virtual Philadelphia Orchestra Learn. The response has been absolutely uh, incredible. And so here we have um, the, uh, the, the promo for Yumi Kendall in, um, in our cello section and Dara Morales, um, I mean, two stars of the orchestra, uh, Dara's a violinist, um, offering a, a side by side Suzuki play in and, and I'll show you the next, uh, the next picture. This is on this, on the computer screen here, you see Dara and her daughter playing and they're connected with a family. I think this is a family in upstate New York. Um, that sent us a photograph and it just shows you the power of the connection that you can still enable uh, in these moments and we wouldn't ordinarily have done this this way um, if it wasn't for the COVID moment and uh, so this is this is how we're how we're adapting um, how we're connecting with um, audiences we wouldn't have otherwise uh, mm -hmm. connected with we've done numerous events like these we've done pre-concert pre-concert talks, special, special conversations with musicians and other, and other artists as well. For example, we, we had a session with the uh, architect of the Kimmel Center, Raphael Vignoli. We solicit questions and comments, and we've had questions and comments from around the world, you know, Tasmania, Australia, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and uh, it, it's incredible the connection that, that, we, that we have uh, created, and it's deeply, deeply moving. Um, in the realm of the work continues and we need to stay front and center with our audiences. This is here now, an online at home gala that uh, Yannick hosted on June 20th. Um, and it was a beautiful gathering together of artists and friends from uh, around the world. Uh, this was the setup, it's very similar, very similar to Tempesta's setup. This is Tanya, Dirksen, our VP of Artistic Production, this was her setup for Here and Now and Here Together that I'll tell you about in a moment. But, you know, we don't usually do this and to adapt to have to work uh, in this way has been just a very exciting and sometimes a little hair raising voyage of discovery. We have different software that we use um, than Tempesta did, but uh, it's, uh, we're now producing our own events. Uh, we weren't able to at the beginning and uh, it has been just a learning experience throughout, throughout the organization for all of us. Um, so this is some of the beautiful special guests that we were able to work with at our at-home gala. Steve Martin, Lang Lang joined us from China, Nicola Benedetti um, and Winton Marsalis. Uh, Renee Fleming and Yo-Yo Ma also joined us. This is Steve Martin wrote a banjo piece and shared it with us and uh, one of our musicians arranged it and Todd Rosenberg, a photographer in Chicago, did a production, a video production of it for us. Uh, the piece is called Office Supplies, hence the sort of Microsoft Office type hues. Um, I'll send uh, the link to that. It's great fun. Um, and Steve Martin is a great banjo player and the musicians had a ball working with him. And as you can see, they all recorded from, from home. Um, Yannick, here's Yannick doing a virtual um, piano voice recital with Renee Fleming. So Renee Fleming recorded this at home. Yannick was at his home in Montreal. And together they gave a touching, touchingly beautiful performance of Strauss's Morgan, which was performed towards the end of our online online gala here now. Um, there's Yo-Yo Ma and Lang Lang who also took part, which was a treat to have them um, drop in via video to the here now gala. 
um, our connection to the community deepened. Um, you know, suddenly we were cut off. You know, ordinarily we'd send groups of musicians to play in, in hospitals, um, and we couldn't anymore. So we worked with, um, we started working with our dear friends at Penn Medicine, but also far has this has expanded far beyond to create a, a program where we now have a dedicated Philadelphia Orchestra channel in every patient room. Um, at Penn Medicine hospitals. And here you can see two pictures. The one on the right um, is uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra channel being shown to a patient uh, on an iPad. The one on the left is uh, it's also on the staff portal for the COVID-19 response team. So they have access to it too. So the music of the Philadelphia Orchestra um, shared widely beginning with Penn Medicine, but now has been expanded dramatically throughout our community, the healing power of music in action. I said that our work continues. Um, I, I can't say irrespective of the COVID moment, but I think it's heightened because of the COVID moment. With the murder of George Floyd, um, we George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, we realized that we could no longer be silent about issues of racism and inequality in our society. Um, our online gala here now was meant to take place on June 6th. This was days after the murder of George Floyd. We, we decided to do something completely different. We created Here Together, which is now a monthly program on uh, talking about racism um, and inequality in uh, in our society, in our community, in the field of classical music, um, especially. And these are public conversations. And the first one took place on June 6th. Um, it was a very powerful moment joining us, um, us being Yannick and I who hosted the, the online program. Joining us were Winton Marsalis, there's Winton with Yannick and me um, talking about these issues in here together. Um, the other guests that night were um, Valerie Coleman, Joseph Conyers from our orchestra, uh, and, uh, and others. It was an incredibly powerful statement that we, um, we delivered live uh, that night, and it has now turned into a strand. Our commitment uh, to this issue is not solely as uh, the term of art is tom totemic. It goes right to our DNA. And this is why we just needed to be speaking very publicly about this critical, critical issue in our society. We really believe that organizations of education and culture are going to be the ones that see our society through this moment and bringing issues um, of critical importance of our society within the realm of music, culture more widely is absolutely critical. We feel that music can change the way we engage with the world around us. And this is one way the Philadelphia Orchestra can help facilitate, um, facilitate that change and lead that change crucially. Here Together was born of ideas. Ideas stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access strategies. Um, ideas has been the process we've been engaged with for over a year now to deeply understand who we are and what we do and how we behave in the realm of diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. And this has been a very thorough data-driven um, process that has recently um, culminated in the development of the Philadelphia Way, is what we're calling the Philadelphia Way, which is an embodiment of our values. So thanks to the techniques and disciplines that we are learning through the idea process, we are confronting this crisis, and I mean both COVID and the crisis of racism in, and violence in our society. We're confronting this crisis with the plan, with authentic and clear communication, empathy, a will to experiment, and a commitment to excellence, to artistic excellence. So while we have our priorities, they may likely shift as circumstances change, but values are immutable. 
Therefore, our values describe and define our strategies and actions that we've embodied in the Philadelphia way. And those values are here, that they are being shaped and defined by ideas. The values are, are thus, that the Philadelphia Orchestra is authentic, um, that we are inclusive and diverse, that we innovate, that we are exceptional. This is our commitment to artistic excellence and that we are a convener of ideas and people and um, organizations. But that authenticity of communication, that empathy of communication, that commitment to inclusivity and diversity, that commitment to innovation, you know, this pivot to becoming a media organization, uh, commitment to artistic excellence, um, and the commitment to bring people together um, is absolutely central to the Philadelphia way and is seeing us now into the sixth month of this uh, incredible global moment that we're all facing. Um, and our world now, the season that we launched in March, um, of course, we realized fairly early on that we wouldn't be able to deliver that season, at least the full part of it, um, as planned. It's called Our World Now, uh, and it's about how does, uh, how can we change the way we engage with the world around us, the environment, technology, women in music, um, those were the original uh, ideas, uh, but of course those have now evolved, our world now. So we have retooled our full planning and we just the other day announced what our plans would be for the fall. Um, and that includes the launch of um, the digital stage. And so um, what's going to feature on the digital stage is a number of programs recorded um, filmed in high quality audio and video on the stage of the Mann Music Center and the Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts and I have incredible gratitude to my colleagues at both those partner organizations so important to the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, and we did an experiment on August 6th where we tried, we tried, we convened the orchestra for the first time since March 12th uh, to make the first recording for the digital stage. And I'm going to share that video with you right now uh, because it's a beautiful and moving moment uh, in the history of the orchestra. So this is the first time the Philadelphia Orchestra got back together since March 12th. It's a preview of the Philadelphia Orchestra's digital stage that launches uh, next month. We're super excited about it and super excited to be able to reconnect with our audiences in this way. a sense of joy like we're finally coming back to work it's like the first day of school I put my clothes out this morning like last night I put the clothes out that I, you know it was it was so much anticipation and the practicing practicing for this and studying the score and everything and so today was just a real culmination of just waiting for this to happen I feel like that just goes to kind of the, 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 the spirit of all of us, of kind of humanity in this time and having to deal with this and having to adjust. And we will adjust and we will make it through and we will persevere. There's nothing like the, the spirit of actually making music communally with people. It is fantastic to be playing with such a great group of musicians again. Like, 
I mean, I'm human. I, I can take it for granted sometimes and feel like, oh, yeah, I'm a member of the Philadelphia Orchestra. I've done it for a long time. But it, it's really kind of eye-opening again. Like, oh, my goodness, the sound is just, you can feel it coming up from the stage, reverberating. So that's an intro to the digital stage and our thanks to Jim Cotter of Articulate for producing that so beautifully. And it is profoundly, profoundly moving. Um, and it was just an incredible moment to be able to reconvene the orchestra on August 6th for that beautiful music. We recorded what you heard there, Tchaikovsky's serenade for strings. Um, the conductor then was our former assistant conductor, Kensho Watanabe. We also recorded um, our composer in residence, Gabriela Elena Franks Leyendas. Um, this concert is going to be made available publicly in September. And then our music director, Yannick Nezesegan, will be back in Philadelphia to record more beautiful performances, just like the one you saw um, later this month, later next month, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, it brings, it brings tears to the eyes. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Teresa and Pressa for the invitation. Um, Gwyn and Ulrika, a great pleasure to be sharing the stage with you today. Thank you all. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, there's a curiosity about how you were able to approach um, programming, particularly uh, since you, as you mentioned, you are an organization that does work on a, a much larger schedule. Um, so I think first part of the question, how were you able to sort of reconfigure current plans or make new plans so quickly for the upcoming years? And also, do you see uh, a cer certain opportunities in shifting the programming from, say, the Kimmel Center to an online format, both in terms of the repertoire uh, you might be able to uh, use, but also um, the ensemble, uh, the instrumentation. So, uh, yeah, you'll have to, that's, that's a multi-part question. Um, first thing to say is I'm just putting some links to other Philadelphia resources in the chat, so hopefully everyone will, will, uh, will get that. Um, I mean, what struck me about the moment is, I mean, first of all, there was the sort of paralyzing fear uh, on, on March 12th and not knowing. Um, but then very quickly, you know, we, we, we gathered around these priorities, we gathered around these values and they have helped shape every decision that, that we've made um, between then and now. What struck me is that this is also a moment of incredible creativity and for us to be thinking about programming works um, for a smaller orchestra, you have to have a smaller orchestra, you know, there's a limit of, I think, 50 people in, an, in a, any particular environment in, uh, in Philadelphia, it may even be 25 at the moment. And so we need to be super creative uh, in terms of the kind of repertoire that we're, that we're planning. So we're planning small scale repertoire and there's a lot of fantastic new music uh, that we're both commissioning and performing. Um, you know, we've got more work by uh, Valerie Coleman, Gabby Frank, Jesse Montgomery, um, Vivian Fung, uh, that will be uh, audio and video recording, um, but also standard repertoire that is the, the everyday of the orchestra. Mahler's Fourth Symphony exists in chamber version. Um, you know, Haydn Mozart symphonies, you know, usually the, the Philadelphia orchestra is, you know, very committed to Bruckner and Rachmaninoff and things like that. But, um, 
you know, Haydn and Mozart symphonies you can do with, uh, with small groups too. So that, it, the, for us, it's been very powerful for, for Yannick and me, especially just the possibilities inherent in this moment. Um, and, you know, the, the, it, it makes the obstacles uh, fall away. The other thing to say is, you know, all, everything we're doing, the, the priority is health and safety. And, and what you saw in that video, um, the power of it is incredible. But what you, it's the result of layers and layers and layers of, um, of, sa of health and safety protocols. And one of which was doing it out of doors, um, which, uh, of course, helps. Thank you. Um does also the, are, are you still uh, sort of, I, I guess, uh, dealing with issues of, you know, certain instruments being more or less uh, possible at this point? Uh, I know there's a lot of critique or concern, maybe not critique around singing, but maybe that also extends to certain woodwinds or something. I mean, I noticed that the outdoor piece was all for strings. For yeah, that was one of the safety things for the for a first outing. We decided just to do just to do strings, and we are working right now on the on the wind safety protocols. Um, you know, there'll be even greater distance. They'll be surrounded by by plexiglass. But if if something's just too risky, we'll change we'll change the repertoire. But yes, I mean the um, the research is evolving. We're getting very we're getting great advice from um, friends at Penn Medicine uh, and others and. Uh, you know, safety is the, the singular priority. And do you, do you see a, a possibility of being performing concerts for uh, live audiences at any point this, during the season? Is it still an open question or has it been ruled out? Uh, we're not ruling anything out. Um, we are taking this a few months at a time. Uh, we just announced last week our plans for September to December. During the fall, we're announce, we'll announce our, our plans for early in the new year. Um, it, you know, the situation is evolving. Right. And do you, do you anticipate that also uh, the repertoire will continue to evolve as, as the sort of protocols change? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and, and, and it's not just, you know, work for small scale orchestra. Uh, you know, 25 to 50 musicians say, we're also doing, you know, redoubling our commitment to our community. I talked a lot about ideas, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access strategy, w strategies. We'll be doing performances at black owned businesses at the National Marian Anderson Museum um, and other iconic venues in Philadelphia. Um, when we talk about how music can change the way we think about the world around us, that's a really critical way. Musicians of the orchestra personally, playing music in important and meaningful locations around our city while it's safe to do so. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I'll just uh, invite any more uh, last minute Q&A. Uh, I have one more, this one's from myself. And uh, I'm, I am curious, you know, given the, the online format uh, and I think different attention spans, have you also been thinking about different uh, program lengths? I know Orchestra con concerts can often be, you know, two hours or, or longer. Yeah. Um, sorry, go sorry, Dustin, go ahead. Um, I, that's a great question. And you prompted me to say something I forgot to mention, which is um, the concerts on the digital stage are going to be shorter. They're going to be maybe full program length will be no more than an hour or so. And, um, you know, there'll be 45 minutes of music and then interviews, a bit like you saw on the Tchaikovsky preview. Um, there'll be interviews with musicians in the orchestra, with the composers, conductors and others, really giving a sense of the, well, the momentousness of the moment. So yes, there will be additional uh, presentations. There will also be, we're creating an online lobby where there'll be uh, pre-concert uh, conversations and a moment to gather at least online in the community. We can't gather in uh, in the lobby of the Kimmel Center anymore um, to share a drink or talk about the concert after, but we can at least gather in our virtual digital stage lobby. I love that. It's a great idea. Uh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing uh, so much about what the Philadelphia Orchestra is doing. It's It's great to see such a history organization representing the city so well during this time. Thank you, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back over to Teresa who'll uh, wrap up today's program, but thanks to you and to uh, Tempeste de Mare. Thank you.
Um, thank you so much. There was a certainly a theme today, as Matthias commented, that um, you know our beloved Philadelphia Orchestra becoming a media organization, and the same for Tempesta de Mare, certainly. Um, so, I, in closing, um, I just thought I would take this opportunity to share some information related to the Presser Foundation for prospective uh, grantee organizations. And, and that is just really that we've made some significant changes to our special projects program area. Um, first and foremost, we moved up the due date for the special projects application from October 15th to September 15th. Um, and that just shift allows us to um, pay out grant funds um, to organizations, um, which is much needed, um, two months ahead of schedule, where you would typically receive maybe in uh, later January, February, you'll be receiving, um, you'll able to receive grant funds more in the uh, like November timeframe. Um, the second thing that we've done is that we've added criteria stating that we are open to receiving creative proposals supporting music programming efforts which can be realized during this fiscal year. Um, so it is our hope that, you know, this next movement series has inspired so many music organizations across the city and beyond. Um, it's our hope that you learned a few things. Um, and, you know, leave here with the confidence um, that grant funds are available through special projects that can be applied towards your immediate and creative programming. So, um, in closing, a really special thank you to Alrika and Gwen from Tempesta de Mare, to Matthias from the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, a big thank you to our co-presenter, American Composers Forum, the Philadelphia chapter, and Dustin Hurt specifically. We will be making this recording available and all the recordings available. I'll be sending around an email to our distribution list. Um, and finally, while this is the last in the series, we do hope um, that it's the start of something new for the Presser Foundation. Um, you know, I would certainly welcome anybody's direct feedback on ideas for convenings and feel free to um, reach out to me um, uh, at your convenience. So thank you very, very much for joining us, um, not only today, but for, um, you know, the other sessions as well. And on behalf of the Presser Foundation with much gratitude um, for all of our music organizations um, across the city. Enjoy the rest of your day.